to everyone. Um, I promise this is not going to be too heavy academic botany, um, but just to set the scene, I'd like to give some background knowledge on the Cape Touristic region before we get on to uh, lots of beautiful plant photos. So the Cape Touristic region is a relatively small area of roughly 200,000 square kilometers. Um, but within this area, we have over 11,400 species, of which 78% occur nowhere else in the world. Um, and this is quite an incredible statistic. Um, the region is one of six global uh, floral kingdoms recognized and has the highest species diversity um, in relation to the area. And also interesting, this is also the only part of South Africa that is winter rainfall primarily. The rest of Southern Africa uh, is all summer rainfall. So why do we have this spectacular diversity in Southern Africa or in the Cape Touristic region? Main reason is we've got diverse habitats and niches in which these plants can occur, um, evolve and adapt in. Um, we've got four main uh, vegetation units being fables, um, uh, strandfeld and forest. Um, but if you look at it, at it a bit closer, um, you'll see even within a small area, you've got very diverse patterns of uh, fine vegetation units forming a mosaic within the landscape. And this has evolved that plants occur on very isolated little patches of vegetation and can vegetation differs greatly from one area a hundred meters away can be completely different just because of the change in soil uh, or even aspect. But let's delve more into what these uh, makes these habitats and niches variable. Starting we've got a severe gradient uh, of rain for uh, in the area um, coming from uh, parts of uh, Jonkersuk here in Stellenbosch that have up to, I think, two to three meters of rainfall a year, uh, going a few hundred kilometers up north where there's barely 50 millimeters a year. Uh, so we've got a high gradient of rainfall and the same for temperature. Um, this is largely dependent on uh, the elevation where you're standing, um, but uh, the, the rainfall and temperature certainly do influence the floristic component of the vegetation. We've got lovely mountains in, in the Cape Floristic region, and you'll see most of them have one side facing the ocean and one side facing inland. Uh, so we've got north south facing mountains as well as east west facing mountains. And the flora on the, on the ocean side differs greatly from what you see. Um, on the inland side. And between these mountains, you've got incredibly rich valleys, um, which I'll be showing you also a bit later on. And within the Cape Flora, we also have greatly diverse soils, um, comprising mainly of uh, sandstones, shale, uh, granite, and limestone. Uh, but these are sort of intertwined in between each other across the landscape. Um, with the granites mostly along the coast as well as the limestone. Um, granites also up into the Mokoland and then the Table Mountain Sandstone Mountains and the, the valleys comprising mostly of shale derived soils. Fire. Many people always complain uh, when there are fires on the mountains, but fire is an incredible driver of our vegetation, in, in particular of the Fainbos habitat. Um, you start off with a fire at hopefully an appropriate time of the year and the appropriate vegetation age. And the first thing that pops up are normally the most beautiful flowers, your orchids, your, your irids, all your bulbs uh, and your annuals. Um, what you see next is your short-lived uh, shrubs that um, often are legumes and um, fix an atmospheric nitrogen into the soil, uh, which enriches the soil to allow larger shrubs, um, either small shrubs, or eventually when you get to your proteas, to persist in what's typically a very nutrient poor soil. 
So what you have when you have a fire is you have a succession of different niches which different plants occupy uh, at some other time. And this allows to have incredible diversity even in a small area. And this is all led to having so many species in the cave. Just some uh, interesting facts. We have 178 plant families uh, known from the region with about 1,000 genera. Uh, interesting enough, the 10 largest families make up 60% of our diversity. Um, and if you think of some of the larger radiations that we have in the Cape, um, about 680 erica species, um, and also 300 plus spelleter species that uh, Frosted and I are working on on and off. Um, and also quite surprising is the diversity that we have of Restios, as well as the, the Iridaceae, which make up um, a large proportion of the flora. Um, what I haven't mentioned here is that the, the mesons, the Azoaceae, and the, um, the daisies, the uh, Asteraceae, each make up roughly 10% of the, the total species diversity in the Cape flora. Now onto the threatened species. Um, interesting enough, this map from, from Sandy um, shows a clear pattern where a large proportion of our threatened species fit very nicely into the Cape Floristic region, um, with a few exceptions being uh, in the Ponderland area, um, the escarpment up in Mufumalanga, uh, and one or two spots in Gauteng and Bobo as well. We have over 20,000 plant species in South Africa, of which 25% are species of conservation concern, meaning they are either threatened with extinction or are naturally rare in their occurrence. Of which 4,000 of these occur in the Great Great Grape Grape Holistic region, um, which is equal to about 80% of all the threatened species within South Africa. The Western Cape has 20 plant species known to be extinct already with another 46 presumed to be extinct. Um, quite a shocking number and uh, something needs to be done about this um, to prevent more species being lost. And uh, that's now the end of the academics. Uh, it's time for a road trip now. Uh, so I produced a map for you of the route we're going to travel this evening. And we will be starting in George, where I started off my career. Um, so as Dave mentioned earlier, I started university in 2012. Uh, and the first thing that we had to learn on campus was to identify 100 different tree names um, by their scientific name, spelling correct and everything. <laughs> um, quite a mission, especially for a first year. Um, but I got through that. Um, and my plant lecturer at the time, uh, Dr. Kuli Kutsia, recommended that I start uh, using iSpot, which has now gone over to iNaturalist. Um, and through that, I made contact with our local crew group in late 2012. And since then, it's just taken off. Now we are heading into the Klein Karua. So I discovered my first two new species back in 2013, uh, both of them Aspalathus uh, from the Swartberg Mountains, and uh, this immediately sparked my interest in, in legumes as I thought, gosh, it's so easy to describe, to discover new species. Uh, what more can I discover? Uh, needless to say, I did not know what was lying ahead for me. Um, part of our crew group, I was also quite useful uh, at high altitude. Um, with the team sending me up to monitor their plants on, on the peaks that were often quite difficult to reach. And I also started doing my uh, first solo uh, monitoring of rare species. Um, at the time, I didn't know my plants very well, so I carried my, my plants of a little karoo with me everywhere I went and stopped every now and then that I found a, a rare plant and <laughs> sat for about 20 minutes just to identify other species around me. 
and now we head a little bit down towards the coast and uh, interesting enough uh, just months before finishing my my MSc on on Pohilia, uh, I happened to stumble across a brand new species uh, literally about 20 meters off a gravel road and the species has now been described uh, the paper will hopefully be published soon um, and the species is literally only known from one population of about 300 plants. Um, thankfully, it's not otherwise threatened. Another interesting find on the other side of the mountain um, is the Spalathus cordicarpa, a very small flowered pea. Um, the type of location has been completely invaded by, by alien black wattle. Um, and wasn't seen since the, the 1950s. Um, one of our best Cape botanists, uh, Jan Flok, had gone several occasions to look for it at the site and couldn't relocate it and as such it was listed as extinct. Um, but just 20 kilometers to the east, um, it is literally a weed on the mountain. Um, very prolific and glad to say that it is no longer extinct. Now we head into the Overberg, an area that has been extensively transformed um, with between 90 to 95% of all Overberg and Osterfeld that's been uh, lost to mostly wheat and canola cultivation, with only a few small patches of Osterfeld remaining, um, not due to the farmers having sympathy for the vegetation, but rather not being able to plow these pieces. But interesting, even in the, in the little pieces, you have incredible diversity that's holding on to a thread by survival. Um, interesting things, uh, even leucodendrons occurring in Ostafel, which is rather strange, and a host of other interesting things. I wish I could show you. I could probably do a slideshow just on the overburger in Ostafel. Uh, but this is, was also the primary site for my master's degree, um, which I rev revised for Helia. Um, the genus, uh, when I started, was recognized as only eight species in it, and was also recognized as being third most threatened plant genus in South Africa. Um, now, thanks to my, my master's, I'm glad to say that I described four new species in the, in the period of my master's degree from this genus, uh, as well as um, sinking polylia canescens into Conata, um, which is also a species thought to have been long lost due to agriculture. Now we head to beautiful Hermanus on, on the Overberg coast. Um, everyone loves going there to watch whales at this time of year. Um, but the problem that many of the coastal areas suffer from uh, is the extensive coastal development uh, that's wiped out most of our coastal fangos uh, with absolutely exquisite species now, also highly threatened by potential future developments. Uh, one only has to think of the uh, the bypass that they want to now do uh, along Hermanus um, that will go through part of the fern tour of nature reserve. Um, we are vehemently opposed to this development and hope that uh, it will not be approved. But this area is also has some incredible species. Uh, the Erica on the top right is only known from Shaw's Pass and is critically endangered. Um, mostly thanks to incredibly bad pine invasions in these mountains. Uh, these pines are spreading uncontrollably and unfortunately any eradication if, uh, efforts are just too slow to, to stop the spread. And now we head to my hometown uh, where our students love to dance and other than dancing students also need accommodation and wine and this has unfortunately led um, to widespread destruction of um, lowland habitat in and around Stellenbosch 
Um, the university and town in general has expanded greatly over the past few decades. And unfortunately, um, one species has been lost from Stellenbosch, um, a Soralia. Um, the last locality was apparently under the, the Dark Bread residence, or is now under the Dark Bread residence. And the beautiful Hemanthus pumilio uh, that you see on the top right is also on the brink of extinction. Um, part of its last remaining habitat was also recently destroyed by the expansion of a new hostel. Now, even worse than Stellenbosch is Cape Town. Uh, each of the crosses you see here is the site of a species that has gone extinct, um, excluding those that are potentially extinct. So, nine species already known to be extinct within the Cape metropolitan area. Um, and unfortunately, um, six of them will not be seen again. Three of them are luckily um, somewhere in cultivation. Uh, one of the major problems that we have in Cape Town uh, is people. Uh, too many people uh, and also people that um, think that pine trees are wonderful and should remain even in Cyan Park's area rather than restoring uh, native vegetation. But among all this devastation of our natural habitat, there is or well, there are some rays of hope. Uh, just last week, I found one of my um, target Indigophora species, uh, an undes undescribed species that only occurs on that little part of Lion's Head, as well as one part near Constantia, and that's all that remains for, for this undescribed species. Um, it's quite easy to walk past them because the flowers are probably only about five to six millimeters in length total. Um, but still, uh, it's a precious little thing that occurs on that little piece of mountain. But if you consider all the devastation that's been happening around Cape Town, there's still incredible diversity of plants. Um, the total number of plant species on Table Mountain is greater than that of the, the whole of the UK. And it's absolutely beautiful species. Um, if you think of the, the silver cone bush on the bottom left um, and so many others, I wish I could include more photos as well. And now we're taking a quick detour into the Tolbach Valley, uh, another exceptional valley, uh, has also lost a lot of uh, vegetation to um, agriculture, mostly uh, pear trees and peaches and also um, fields of wheat. But uh, in the remaining pieces, and especially on the mountain, there's some exceptional plants. Um, the Ixia verdiflora on top right uh, is being one of them. And also from this area uh, comes probably my, my greatest find that was completely by accident. Um, last year I happened to stumble across this rather obscure looking Soralia that turned out to be Soralia cataracta that hadn't been seen in over 200 years. Um, and I'm glad to say that it's quite prolific in the area that it is growing, um, but it has to be monitored as there are alien plants uh, in the area. Um, luckily, they occur in valleys that are uh, not seeming to be uh, destroyed for further crop agriculture. Now onto the Swartland, uh, another area similar to the Overberg, um, extensively transformed, over 95% of the vegetation has been lost. Um, but in this area is also incredible diversity of, of species that occur on the small isolated patches of vegetation. Um, one particularly of interest to me, um, and I'm sure Dave Pepler is not even uh, aware of, is that this Babiana has inverted its flowers, um, that the reproductive parts are actually at the bottom end of the flower, where your normal irids 
always have uh, reproductive cords at the top of the flower. Uh, just an interesting thing uh, to show out. This specific Babiana is listed as critically endangered as well. Um, but an absolutely beautiful species. Um, another interesting find up in the Swartland area was Polyleg nota, another species that was thought to be extinct for, for over 80 years. Um, and since rediscovering it in 2016, um, we've managed to locate a total of four populations now, uh, consisting of over 200 plants. Um, so there is yet hope for some of our critically endangered, potentially extinct species. The cost of a cup of tea, that includes me. Uh, this is on top of the Cedarburg. Um, unfortunately, the lower areas uh, surrounding the Cedarburg have not been so lucky. Uh, I love my robust tea as well, but I, I cringe every time I drive past the area and think that I'm contributing to, to the destruction of the area. Um, and quite sad that they're actually destroying actual rooibos tea habitat uh, to plant fields and fields of rooibos tea and thus endangering the natural populations of rooibos. Um, but this area again has incredible plants um, in these pieces that remain uh, and also on the higher areas and one has to hope that um, further expansion of rooibos cultivation is significantly uh, suppressed, otherwise we're going to be losing a lot of incredible species. Um, unfortunately, Cedarburg is not the only area that, that's been suffering. Um, one only has to look at this uh, Google Earth image of the Gifburg um, to really become worried. The total area of the Gifburg that's been lost to rooibos cultivation is probably between 30 and 40 percent. Um, and the Gifburg is also home to incredible plant species. Um, the Indigofra on the top left corner, um, literally only known from one or two little spots uh, on the Gifburg, uh, as well as the Oxalis on the bottom left, bottom right hand corner, uh, growing in the seepage areas very near to this Indigofra of mine. Fate of potato, we're heading now on another detour to the Sunfelt, another area that's been extensively transformed, uh, mostly for potato cultivation. Um, if you look over Google Maps, you'll see these perfect circles in the field, and uh, that's indicative of the, the potato farms, and they've completely destroyed a lot of our precious Sunfelt. Um, just to show you a few species, from the sun for that. I haven't done a lot of work in there actually. Um, but uh, between Prof Sturton and myself, we're describing at least three brand new species to science from the sun fell. And there are probably more as uh, habitats are really not being explored very well. Um, interesting as well, just for a little change, I've included this beautiful gelodus. Um, the sun fell has got some incredible insects as well. Now we're heading up towards the Makwaland, um, stopping first in the Knausflakte, um, an area that looks like it really doesn't have much going for it. Um, but this area has been heavily hit by poachers, um, mostly for conifitums and other succulents, uh, for the illegal trade. And unfortunately, these plants get taken out by the ton in these areas, and many of these species are now becoming the incredibly threatened. Um, here's just a few photos of uh, these relatively collected species from the area, um, including conophytons, uh, ornithoglossum. Um, one of my favorites that I recently saw with it was this beautiful uh, Larry Leachia um, that I found here in the Rufusfeld. Absolutely beautiful little thing. Our final stop is where I did my last long field trip to, and that's the Rufusfeld. Um, beautiful area, um, and quite interesting that one of our largest rivers 
flows through the area. And just a few kilometers away, we have iconic um, aloe species that are busy dying off in mass. Um, this is aloe pearsoni. And unfortunately, due to the drought of the last seven years, um, driving through the area, I estimate that there was probably a population reduction of about 90%. And uh, if there's a further drought, the species will probably go extinct in the area within 10 years. Um, but obviously the main threat that this area is, is facing is climate change. Um, and we have to all play our part in uh, mitigating the effects of climate change. It may be too late for some of these beautiful iconic species like the crooked worm, um, but we hope that it's not. Um, and climate change is likely to result in the loss of species in this area. Um, and are we expecting a, a new floristic composition? I don't think so. Um, but interesting enough, like many, many of the deserts across the world, the Rochtersfeld is also incredibly diverse uh, in annual species. So these are perfectly adapted to, to the desert environment where they only emerge after, after sufficient rain, flower quickly, set seed, and then die back. Uh, also quite a few geophytes in here, um, but overall the majority of species are annuals. And we can only hope that the Rochtersfeld does not use its iconic trees and, and aloes. Uh, but that's the end of, of this road trip. Um, I think the take home message here is that we need to be aware of, of what we do uh, directly and indirectly to the environment um, and try to mitigate our personal impacts on the environment uh, either through recycling, um, purchasing locally produced produce, um, many things, we just need to be aware of the situation going on around us. Uh, so that's enough of that. Um, what lies ahead for me is I'm busy with my masters of PhD, um, revising the Indigofra within the, the gated, Greater Cape Floristic region. Um, we presume that, our, that there are 120 plus taxa, although, um, the numbers just seem to be increasing as the days go by and I keep on doing more field work. Um, there are over 40 plus undescribed taxa just from this region in this genus. Um, and I've luckily collected over 75% of all the Indigofra taxa in, a, in and around the Cape Forest region um, in the last 16 months. So I've been quite busy and uh, as you can see, yeah, I've really chosen a beautiful group to work on. Um, I've got my work cut out for me, but I've got incredible support behind me. Um, and I hope to finish my PhD sort of towards the, the beginning of 2022. Um, I'd like to thank my family and friends for all their support over the years, uh, crew members, crew leaders, um, the team from the Red List, um, my mentors and supervisors that have um, come in tonight to listen to the talk, um, greatly appreciate them. Um, to the universities that I've been and I am affiliated to, um, very grateful to them as well. And also to the NRF. I was very fortunate to receive quite a bit of funding for the study for various aspects of my study. Uh, and thank you for listening tonight. Thanks, Brian. Um, I, I do admit I was doing a bit of multitasking between the honorary rangers in Darba and the talk there. So I hope I didn't miss this um, being presented. But if I can ask, I think the, one of the bigger threats to the biodiversity is global warming and climate change and those things which you did touch on. But is there a threat to the biodiversity through uh, cut flower um, sales and that kind of thing. And then the second part of that question, is there um, uh, sort of initiatives to try and plant these plants that are more rare in people's gardens in conditions where they can almost make them more um, 
uh, common or th 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 that there's actually environments where they could survive um, where biodiversity um, is being challenged due to um, areas uh, or lack of habitat. Uh, thank you for the questions, Marty. Um, regarding the cut flowers, uh, there are certainly species that are being affected, um, but to a lesser extent on a commercial basis, it's more um, from just average citizens uh, picking flowers uh, in the field. Um, a lot of the cut flowers are actually now planted, um, fields and fields of proteas, for, for example, are planted on top of uh, Piketberg in, in parts of the Overberg around uh, Napier. Um, so to a lesser extent on a commercial basis, but definitely um, through, through average citizens walking in the field, um, eating legally picking flowers. Luckily not too bad, um, but um, it is definitely a concern. Um, and then regarding uh, your second question, just remind me again. Um, People planting in the uh, various... Oh, yes, planting. Um, it's definitely being considered. Kirstenbosch has quite a bit of uh, conservation collection going. And um, Stellenbosch University Botanical Garden is also now under, under Donovan Kirkwood, uh, getting quite a bit of conservation planting going. Uh, so we actually do have some polylias growing in the Stellenbosch gardens now. Um, but the problem is, is space. Um, we have the necessary knowledge to grow a lot of these things. Um, in terms of growing them in people's gardens normally, that's, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, there are probably quite a few legal issues, especially with uh, the plants that are already threatened by legal harvesting in the, the felt, um, disseminating which are grown in cultivation and which have been harvested from the felt, um, and then also the specificity of some of the plants. Some of them just won't survive in certain environments. Thank you, Brian. The next question, Neil Schuff. Welcome back, Neil. I'm unmuting you. Thanks, Chris, and hello, hello to everyone. Uh, Brian, congratulations on all your discoveries, and thank you so much for a very fascinating talk. It was very interesting. It was lovely to travel around the country while you're sitting in your lounge. Um, my question is regarding fire and, and man-made fire, and during your travels, have you seen more and more of a negative impact from man-made fire that is out of the normal Feinbos burning natural cycle. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good evening, Neil. Um, definitely. Um, if you consider there are some areas um, that are being burned too regularly, uh, one of them being near uh, Hermanus. Uh, it's often a case of, uh, for example, informal settlements. As soon as they're dissatisfied with the municipality, they just set fire to the felt next to them, and then uh, that way they gain uh, the attention of the municipality. Um, but the contrary is also um, in effect. Uh, we've got a lot of areas that aren't burning enough and are either changing into a, a different bio, uh, fangles going into forest, um, or that they just not burning areas for up to 70 years in some places. And you see a dramatic decrease in the number of species around. Um, hopefully most of them will return after a fire. Um, but definitely when you leave the felt that long, there's also a much better chance of alien proliferation as well. Um, you just see that in some of the areas turn to forests of wattle or forests of pine. And as soon as the fire comes through there, you just have a monoculture of, of them and the frame loss is basically lost. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Pippa Haruf. Pippa, Hello. I can see the top of your head. Almost see your glasses tonight. You're improving a bit. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to get help. I've been I've been promised help. But, um, 
Thank you, Brian. It was a one, wonderful presentation. Um, the, is the rooibos and potato industry, are they being controlled? That, that's my first question. And secondly, you, the plant that you've chosen to do your PhD or the group that, that you've chosen to do your PhD on, I can't remember the name, they, it's, they seem to be all very similar in color, the different, um, you know, the different uh, species or, or whatever. Is that something to do with pollination or, or, or is the color very much more varied? I saw there was one white one, but all the others were much the same color. Okay, good evening. Um, yes, uh, to some extent, the, the potato farms and rooibos cultivation is regulated. Um, but unfortunately, there's just uh, too much area to actually enforce uh, the legislation around um, uh, cultivating virgin land. Um, and if uh, a farmer decides he wants to plow a new piece of land, uh, more often than not, he'll just go ahead and there will be uh, no repercussions for him. No one will really know and not many people will really care about it. Um, the rooibos tea is mostly large scale producers, but um, in some areas, especially if you go around the Portal area, uh, there's a lot of small scale farmers, um, mostly subsistence rooibos that they produce just enough to basically sell to larger companies to survive. Um, but these areas are being terribly transformed and to some extent I don't think there's enough regulation there. Um, and regarding the indigofera colors, good question. Um, I've seen across the, the legumes in general in the, in the Cape, we have um, very little variation in color within, within groups. Um, so if you look at the 300 Spalatha species, we have, for example, more than 90% of them are yellow flowered. And then just the odd one is either pink, red, or, or white flowered. Um, Indigofera, it's pink is a good color for a flower, so um, it's it's advantage advantageous for that group to have flowers um, of that color. But the interesting thing that Indigofera have uh, in terms of their pollination strategy is that most of them drop their petals as soon as they've been pollinated. Um, so pollinators cannot visit the same flower multiple times in most cases. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Pippa. You, Pippa. Uh, Brian, Pippa is a West Coast girl. She lives in Langaban. Uh, she runs the fossil park there. So stop by yeah. and say hello next time you're passing there. I was, I was in the fossil park in 2016, uh, back when they were still busy with uh, the new ex excavations, but I'll definitely go around again. Trust yeah. me, she's been there since then. <laughs> <laughs> Way before. <laughs> hey, Pips. Yes, and we've got fossil pollens of uh, fanboss from our deposits. It's one of the earliest records of fanboss in this region. Five million years. Yeah. Oh. Five to ten million years. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Papa. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to check, are there any other questions? And to all your mentors again, who I see here, uh, a number of them uh, always think about the expression that says, when the student is ready, the master will come. Uh, the student was ready and the, ma the master's came. Well done to all of you. Okay, I could ask a question if you don't mind, Brian. The, um, the, yes, the, obviously the, the, the Feinbos is obviously now very, very um, patchwork. It's, it's, it's completely, completely broken up into island little islands of of, of habitat in, in lots of places. Um, the, when it when it existed as a whole, when Jan van Rubeck got there, what did it look like then? You know, because it had game, it had rhino, rhinos and giraffes. How did they influence it? How would they have influenced it? Yeah, Ron, I think every one of us around here today wish that we could teleport ourselves back to those days just to see what it looked like. Um, but I think back then when we had large large mammals, they probably played an important role uh, 
especially in seed dispersal. Um, I think of the polylias that I studied for my MSc and how patchy their distribution was. And I could only think that potentially large mammals such as black rhinos would have um, eaten the seeds and then disposed of them a couple of kilometers away. Because um, otherwise, in general, the seeds just fall straight to the ground and then go from there. So there must have been some way that seeds were dispersed. Um, otherwise, um, there was probably not enough game to create lawns and, and stuff uh, like we have in Savannah. Um, but if I think the, the Overberg Norse felt as well, it's quite a high grassy component, so there were probably a lot of large mammals in there. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comments from any of uh, our distinguished guests on tonight? Just raise your hand. Okay. Well, it seems to me we on the hour. Linky told me she was rather uh, forceful saying, keep it short, which you did. And thank you. And uh, I, I think that we uh, want to thank you again for your wonderful talk tonight. And we want to encourage you to keep going, Brian. That's one thing. I, you, you, uh, the, the the, the sky is the limit for you. I can see that and just want to encourage you and all of those of you who are involved, keep supporting, keep going. And if there's anybody who would like to also help contribute to the protection of the plants, do connect with custodians of rare and endangered wildlife flowers. I think it's Sitsi Zede. So um, please do that. Okay, then uh, now we are formally done with the discussion tonight. We can unmute or you can, we will now allow you to mute and unmute yourself as you wish. And then you can chat with the family and say hi to whoever you would want to until we have only 25 on the screen and then we, then we close it. Prof. I think Marty's got his hand ris, ris, raised again. Risen his uh, hand again. I've Marty has arisen. I thought it's the blue sky <laughs> behind Marty. Okay, Marty. <laughs> so, so Rod, actually, Rod actually asked the second question that I had in the in the breach, but I'll ask uh, my last one then. Um, a lot of these um, areas where flowers occur are outside of reserves or national parks or anything like that. It's on private property or just open on the sides of the roads, etc., and on farms. Do you think, is there a strategy to try and enlarge the national parks to include these areas so that the biodiversity is protected? Or is there, like, is, is that a viable option to try and make half of those, well, not half, but, you know, all those areas actually into some kind of a extensive national park? Is that a viable option? Uh, so, a lot of the small areas, uh, particularly in the lowland regions, um, we have conservation agencies, uh, for instance, in the, in the Overberg, the Overberg Lowlands Conservation Trust, uh, that engage actively with farmers and um, encourage them to sign conservation easements, especially if they have uh, small pieces of vegetation with uh, endangered species on their land. Um, and that way, through the, the easement agreements, um, it is basically written into the title deed, as far as I understand the, the legal jargon, um, that no one in the future, even if the, the farm is sold to someone else, may plow that piece of land work. Um, in terms of engaging with uh, sand parks, Cape Nature, for instance, um, that's something more that the, the Red List team does. So our crew data um, on rare and endangered species that we find uh, is fed uh, straight to the, the Red List team. And from there, they decide on both the, the status of the species and then also identifying priority areas that need to be conserved. And then they will engage with sand parks or uh, local conservation agencies 
to look at either expanding reserves, um, getting conservation agreements with farmers, um, or starting private local nature reserves. Um, the farmers in general that I come in contact with are very um, accommodating and always happy to allow me to walk on their, on their land and also to um, discuss uh, the endangered species that are potentially on their property and how best to conserve it. And in terms of um, the tourist market, are local farmers actually seeing a financial benefit to um, conserving those areas of their farms um, through the tourism? Or is that, you know, kind of, there's, there's a, it's, it's quite difficult. You can't make each person that comes onto your property pay because it's kind of open. I, I just, is, there, is there a sort of a model or a framework that's been thought of to try and, you know, conserve it going forward, but also, you know, making a value attributable to it? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a little bit of a difficult one, Marty. Uh, the problem is that it's often difficult to determine whose land you actually end up walking on. Um, it's so easy to hop over a fence. I think a lot of us do that and end up on people's land that we don't have permission for. Um, but in terms of um, it being a viable tourism option, um, probably in most cases not. Um, you're probably aware of the, the spate of farm attacks that we have in South Africa in general. And uh, thus farmers are a little bit wary of allowing strangers onto the property. Um, you normally have to make prior arrangements. And um, if you do just pitch up there, just hope that they're friendly. Um, and in general, the, the problem is that there's so many little pieces um, it's not really viable to market a single one of them. Um, mm -hmm. There are nature reserves, uh, the Overberg Nature Reserve, Harvax Kluft, uh, that's the largest remaining piece of Rhinocephal that's, that's open to accommodating guests. Um, and definitely if people are interested in seeing some very beautiful species in the Overberg uh, that they can consider Visiting Harvest Club Nature Reserve. Um, it's down between Rudarstorp um, and Swell and Dam. Um, unfortunately, the small pieces, they're just basically there. Um, there's no real financial gain for the farmers. Um, most occasions, they just can't plow the land, so it just stays there. Thanks, Brian. Thank Brian, I see Sabil Ritzmuller wants yes. to ask a question. Sabil? Yes, actually, uh, Brian, haven't you been to Cortbos? Cortbos or the Eastern Cape? This is a private protected area entirely uh, relying on protecting Feinbos vegetation. And they're running for decades and they're doing okay as long as tourism was, of course, going okay. So they are, have a lodge and it protects uh, a large area of wonderful Feinbos. I think, uh, Chris, you have been there or you have been in touch. In yes. Yeah, you're talking, yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, you, you definitely know Grootbos at Hermanus. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, I was there in, in May. Um, uh, one of the girls that works there, Rebecca, actually discovered a, a brand new indigo for us. So uh, during lockdown, I sort of made a, a roundabout trip to quickly go and collect it. Um, no, it's for business, it's fine. I need to learn from Grootbos now. Yes, and it's a park uh, entirely of, of vegetation, you know. They have no major animals and they are protecting the park with business, which is tourism. But of course, tourism at the moment is uh, very low, so they're just trying to recover now.